I will tell you a theory, <laughs> and hopefully you will not be tricked. Uh, but um, what we will talk about today is what is social engineering, uh, why it is important, um, and obviously social engineering has been around for many years. This is not a new topic, uh, but it's recent. Uh, development or uh, the current scenario uh, that makes it more dangerous uh, than it used to be. Um, and then what we can do about it, how, how we can use, how we can test for human vulnerabilities uh, to improve security. So initially we'll have an introduction, um, then we'll uh, discuss uh, sort of engineering characteristics um, and then how we can use uh, awareness raising and testing for human vulnerabilities. Um, and what are the things we have learned uh, through the research that we have done. And finally, uh, provide some recommendations. Okay, so um, what we are seeing is definitely that security is taken a lot more seriously uh, at the organizational and governmental uh, level. So we see across the globe, um, that a lot more investments in security. Um, we see the cyber security strategy across uh, different countries across the globe, but also at organizational level, um, we can see that the, the budgets that are um, given to security uh, are rising. Um, so I will just uh, uh, provide some statistics from the Information Security Breach Survey, the latest one, which uh, showed that 10% of the IT budget for large organizations uh, is spent on security. Uh, and this is even higher for small, medium enterprises, which is 12%. And uh, just to give you an idea, in 2012, that budget was 8% for large organizations. So you can see that uh, investment in security is rising. Uh, and moreover, it is expected to continue rising uh, in the following years. Um, so, for 92% of respondents, they will spend at least the same or more uh, in uh, security. Um, and especially larger organizations, 52%, uh, more than half of larger organizations, will increase their uh, spending in security uh, in the following year. Um, so, this is really important uh, because it shows the level of commitment in security, okay? So, um, if um, uh, organizations and governments are spending more in security, then you would expect that um, the, um, the level of um, uh, services, security services would improve. Um, at the same time, though, um, what we're seeing is that investments um, tends to go for more technical uh, aspects. So uh, technological controls uh, will receive a lot more attention than human aspects. And so um, what is uh, the problem is that um, basically um, um, uh, uh, training uh, receives less attention uh, than uh, other uh, security controls. For example, in um, uh, the level of training that was reported in the Information Security uh, Bridge Survey was, um, uh, in some cases, uh, the organizations weren't really even providing, uh, about half, they weren't really providing um, training uh, at uh, uh, continuous training, awareness training, uh, and in, uh, in some cases they were only providing uh, a, a training and induction only. Um, and yet, when we look at um, the importance of having a, a well-understood security policy and ongoing training, uh, we can see that in uh, about 93% uh, of companies uh, with, um, sorry, in, in cases of um, companies with poorly understood policies, so with no training and uh, with uh, uh, no uh, well understood policies, uh, they reported 93% of uh, breaches, um, whereas uh, the level uh, for the companies who, who had well understood policies, it dropped down to 47%, which is 
uh, yeah, it is really uh, a, a big difference. Okay, and when we look at um, what happens after a serious security breach, uh, we can see that uh, staff training seems to be uh, the most um, likely course of action, uh, course of um, action in response to, uh, to a security breach. So. Um, 46% uh, uh, of um, 46 of uh, respondents they uh, they opted for uh, staff training. So it looks uh, that um, training is an afterthought after a security incident, rather than something that is factored in into the security um, um, offerings. Um, and of course, if you were an attacker, what would you do? Um, would you go for the well-protected network resources, servers, uh, workstations that everybody would be looking and watching uh, with uh, all the resources? Um, and obviously uh, risk getting caught uh, as a result? Or would you go for the easy target, which, was, which is the humans? Um, to quote uh, Kevin Whitney. Do you know Kevin Whitney? Yes? Um, so Kevin Whitney was um, uh, one of the, I think, the first convicted hacker um, back in, well, many years ago now. But um, his main uh, characteristic was that he went for these human vulnerabilities. He wasn't necessarily uh, a, a very competent hacker uh, in the sense that his, his main skill was convincing people um, to do what he wanted. Um, and so to quote him, he said it's much easier to trick somebody into revealing the passwords than to carry out an elaborate hack uh, for the same person, uh, the same purpose. Um, and um, definitely, as I said, uh, social engineering has been around for uh, many years. Um, and it's not a new concept. Um, and the main uh, purpose or the main aim is that it gets, um, it exploits human weaknesses and manipulates people into breaking normal security procedures. Um, and so, yeah, if you were a hacker, you wouldn't really uh, go for um, uh, the assets that are well protected, uh, but you would go for the easy target. Um, so, why is social engineering important? Um, why is it that, um, well, yeah, what's the opportunity really um, in that respect? So, um, what we're seeing is that social engineering is evolving. Um, back in um, the 2000s uh, or the, the previous uh, decade, basically, we would see uh, we would still see social engineering uh, attempts. Mainly, uh, they would come as um, spam messages or indiscriminate attempts to get you to reveal your credit card details and uh, maybe these Nigerian 409 scams where they were presenting these huge opportunities or with these poor, re sorry, the, the very rich relatives and uh, who wanted to um, put a lot of money into your accounts and all you need to do is just provide the account so that they can credit, they can transfer all this money. So, um, in these cases, um, the, um, the social engineering techniques were still the same, but it was very easy to um, detect the signs um, and to be able to see exactly, uh, or, yeah, I mean, it, it was very easy to spot uh, a social engineering uh, attempt. Um, of course, they were more targeted attacks even then, um, and but if you read uh, Ken Miller's book, uh, you'll be able to see uh, lots of different examples as to how he went about. Um, tricking uh, people. Uh, so there were still targeted attacks even then with a lot of background information, but it was not easy uh, to target people. It was not as easy to target people as it is now. Um, so what we're seeing um, is that spam email uh, is decreasing, um, and as there are lower opportunities to target people on social networks, um, 
and so on, uh, uh, we are seeing that uh, yeah, there are a lot of values, a, a lot a lot more uh, vectors uh, in which you can target people. Um, and uh, and, and um, a worrying threat is the, the fact that targeted attacks uh, are uh, definitely on the increase. So going back to the um, uh, the Semantics uh, Internet Security Threat Report, uh, the latest one, uh, they are look, they are uh, seeing a, a decrease in uh, spam uh, number of spam percentage of spam, um, but at the same time they are seeing a, a huge increase uh, in targeted attacks. So what are these targeted attacks? Well, basically, rather than just um, send a general email in the hope that somebody um, uh, will fall for it and uh, will do what you want them uh, to do. So rather than do that, you are targeting specific individuals within organizations by having done a lot of background research uh, in the meantime and making the attack a lot more convincing. Um, and <clears throat> the, um, another interesting finding from uh, the Internet Security Threat Report was the targets of these targeted attacks. So about half of the targets were large corporations, so 50%, with uh, 2,500 employees and more. But what is more interesting is the fact that um, the other half came from smaller companies. Um, so you might think, well, why is that significant? Uh, why would smaller companies uh, be a target? Can you think of why? Okay, so they have left, uh, uh, the, the policies are not well understood, they might not even have security policies, so they are easier targets, is that what you're saying? Maybe. Yeah, okay, definitely. The, they are easier targets, so they are a lot easier to infiltrate, yeah? Um, but then again, there is also the one more reason, which is why this is significant. Can you think of what? Because, as I said previously, um, it is you, uh, sort of attackers tend to be lazy in the sense that it's a lot easier to go for the easy targets rather than go for the, uh, the high protective assets. So, large organizations are more likely to be better secured, um, and small organizations are more likely to be easier targets. But in quite often, uh, smaller organizations work with larger organizations, so they co cooperate at some level. Um, and so, by uh, going after, uh, sort of following the supply chain, if you want to target a large organization, you go for its suppliers, which are likely to be easier targets. And so, um, what we're seeing is uh, this increasing trend of going for the small organizations, not just because they are easier target, but because by infiltrating the smaller organizations, eventually you end up going after the larger um, corporations as well. And another um, trend that we're seeing is what we call uh, what we call attacks, which are, in a way, um, watching um, the victims, uh, the kind of websites that they go to, uh, that they they usually visit, uh, scanning these websites to look for vulnerabilities. If you manage to inject code uh, into these websites, then it's only a matter of time before your victims end up getting infected. Um, so kind of like um, uh, waiting uh, to infect your victim, kind of like uh, what the lion would do um, in uh, waiting at a, a, a watering hole. Okay? Um, and again, um, we're seeing sort of new ways of targeting and attacking uh, particular individuals. Um, okay, so let's look at the characteristics of a social engineering attack. And uh, let me just say that um, as a 
that social engineering has been around for many years and the characteristics in which you can make uh, um, social engineering attacks successful has been known for many years. Um, the, uh, yeah, the difference is that now you have more needs uh, into making it more successful. Um, so, uh, looking at uh, the characteristics, uh, uh, first of all, you need a, a, the perfect pretext. Okay? Pretext is the scenario that uh, you devise in order to trick victims. Okay? Um, and so, um, what would that be? Um, if you are uh, trying to target people by email, um, it could be that uh, sort of this. Um, Let's say the Nigerian scams, scams okay? The, um, uh, this um, relative, a very rich relative that wants to um, uh, transfer information into your account and is just looking for some kind of person to uh, not let this fortune get lost uh, or something like that. So it, um, it's the scenario that somebody thinks in order to get you to do what they want. Um, very important uh, in uh, um, to get the pretext right is to, to get your facts right first. And so all this background research uh, that you need in order to make the pretext more convincing. And as I said, in the olden days, uh, where you was, or, um, a social engineer would manifest itself as a, a general email, um, and it would be very easy to spot the signs. And it was very easy to. Um, to defend against it, but uh, what we are seeing is that um, the yeah because it's a lot easier now to do more background research by going into um, social networking sites by monitoring people and knowing exactly what they do by Twitter and so on. Um, it is a lot easier to get this uh, background uh, research by using Google, for example. Uh, there is a lot of information that you can discover. Um, and so, um, it is basically um, um, a very crucial aspect uh, into making the, the attempt uh, more convincing. At the same time, timing, again, is really crucial. For example, in my particular uh, experience, uh, when somebody called me, uh, the time was crucial. Had I not uh, had this mobile phone, uh, had, had I not bought it the day before, uh, I would probably easily dismiss it and say, oh, this is simply um, uh, irrelevant and they just want my credit card details. Um, but because this was an insider uh, case, so somebody inside uh, that mobile phone company leaked information to uh, third parties, as a result, it became a lot more convincing. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, examples like that. For example, um, uh, back in 2005, uh, the, when we had the, uh, we had the tsunami in uh, uh, Southeast Asia, and uh, there was um, there were a lot of emails back then uh, asking for people to donate for the victims of uh, uh, the catastrophe, and so the timing. Um, so, in terms of um, what traits uh, social engineering uh, exploits, um, it's uh, uh, basically um, we have identified uh, six possible uh, characteristics which can be exploited. Okay, so one of them is authority. Uh, so somebody uh, will convince you to do what they want by claiming to be a uh, higher ranking uh, official, uh, somebody really important that needs them to do what they want right at that second. So uh, a classic example would be calling um, somebody from the, help de the, the IT help desk and saying, oh yes, I'm a very, uh, I'm claiming to be a very important CEO of the company who is away on the business trip, for some reason they have lost their contact detail of their user account and they need it urgently in order to access uh, a really important resource. So of course in that case, if you have somebody so high ranking, uh, of course you would want to, uh, to help them and uh, not to get into trouble. Um, so this is one 
um, you know, uh, one property that can be exploited. Similarly, um, uh, commitment and consistency. So if you have committed time and effort into doing something, then you are less likely to give it up. So uh, by offering an opportunity and something that looks um, very legitimate initially and you invest some time into helping maybe somebody, um, then you are less likely to give it up when things become a bit suspicious. Um, and um, a very important um, uh, characteristic is liking and similarity. So if um, you like somebody, you are more likely to trust them. And if they look a lot more like you, you are more likely to trust them, and therefore you are more likely to form a victim. Um, similarly, um, looking at um, uh, reciprocation, um, so if you, um, let's say, um, somebody does something nice for you, and then you will feel obliged to, uh, to return the favour. Uh, a classic example there would be looking at, or let's say, um, you have a, a secretary uh, or a, a PA uh, who is, uh, is you know, has some technical problems, maybe even technical problems that have been engineered uh, on purpose by somebody. Um, and so by offering to help and fixing those problems, and then uh, they would be more likely to help and provide, um, uh, I would say, uh, whatever other information uh, uh, you might need. Um, and scarcity uh, is basically when um, you make the target believe that whatever is being offered uh, has is a very good opportunity and it, has, it can only be available within a very short uh, period of time. Um, so, um, Basically, um, when you uh, one example could be, uh, well, as I said, these Nigerian scams where uh, you're saying, you know, um, uh, this is a very urgent situation and you can only um, take advantage of this uh, offer uh, within the next week or within the next few hours. Um, in my uh, experience, um, it had to be, you know, there was definitely some urgency in there and uh, it wasn't uh, yeah, it wasn't an opportunity as such, but it was, uh, there was definitely um, uh, an urgency there where they, they made you think that unless you do exactly what they want right now, um, they, they would cancel your contract or they would, you know, they would take away something that you really, really want. Um, and, uh, finally, uh, another example is uh, social uh, validation, where basically when you're seeing other people uh, do uh, the same thing, then you're more likely to follow suit. Uh, and this again uh, is exploited, by, for example, by having uh, not just one person, but like two people uh, trying to convince somebody else uh, into, uh, uh, I don't know, opening a door or something like that. Uh, that they are not supposed to. Um, but at the same time, um, apart from these um, characteristics, um, and, and other, uh, sort of other types of uh, other researchers have identified perhaps um, other behavioral traits. For example, Stevens uh, has identified the conformity uh, or the desire to be helpful in all of these characteristics that I've said. There's there is this underlying um, uh, characteristic where people just want to be helpful, they want to help. And when they are presented with unusual situations, in unusual scenarios, they, you know, sometimes they have to go off script. And that's um, a really important characteristic of um, social engineering. Um, so, we looked at um, psychology, so the psychology aspects don't change really, um, so they, they have been the same uh, all these years, but what has changed is the technology um, and the opportunities that technology uh, can bring. So, 
if you look at um, um, the wealth of information that is available, which can allow you to specifically target individuals and make your uh, attacks a lot more convincing, your pretext a lot more convincing, then uh, you can see how easy it is, or how yeah, how easy it is to um, um, to succeed. Um, so one example could be uh, organizational websites. Uh, you can have uh, spiders that will uh, crawl through your website. They will collect um, important information such as contacts, uh, employees, uh, products, um, email addresses, office locations, um, job postings. Uh, sometimes there is a lot more information that can be revealed by job postings. Uh, for example, the kind of technologies that they're using. Um, if um, you see a, a job posting for a, a smart engineer or a smart analyst, um, then you can pretty much guess that what kind of intrusion detection systems they're using. Um, similarly, um, you can, um, uh, by, by crawling through the, uh, the websites, in, in some cases, um, you, you get people who go for the job postings, um, and send CVs just to get themselves into an interview and within that interview they are able to learn a lot more about how the, the company works and uh, what services they have and servers and so on. Um, and as a result uh, they are able to gather a lot of uh, intelligence. Um, uh, at the same time uh, you can also go back in time. So by going from web archives such as the Wayback Machine, uh, you're able to see the organizational website and the contact it used to have in the past. So all job postings and all products uh, and email addresses and so on. Um, and um, also uh, with uh, the tools that are available, you can even categorize and pick out uh, terminology, uh, the style of language, uh, and the projects maybe that might be important in, in a company. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you can download or you can identify any documents, and more importantly, the metadata uh, that can be stored in these documents. So, you know, we are all using uh, Word and Excel and Acrobat Reader and so on, PDF files. So all of these files, they have a lot of information, metadata information stored, and, and that could reveal a lot of information like usernames, um, like um, file system structures, um, um, author names, uh, uh, software, client software that might be used, and so on. So there is a lot of uh, yeah, a, a lot of material, uh, a lot of information, a lot of indications that would help guide somebody um, into um, giving giving them a background, basically, uh, of uh, the area. So um, more importantly, uh, you can use uh, search engines, Google. Uh, there is a whole database uh, with uh, Google ha of Google hacking uh, with ready strings that can help you into searching any kind of confidential information you want, and you can target particular organizations uh, for that fact, for that matter. Um, but also, you can uh, infiltrate social networking sites, and uh, we have done, or there has been research that has shown exactly how easy it is to infiltrate. Uh, social networking sites and the controls, uh, the authentication controls, uh, security controls are um, uh, yeah, uh, trivial to bypass. So uh, LinkedIn, people are more likely to share information on LinkedIn, uh, sort of about their projects and, uh, and the employment history and everything. Um, Facebook has more personal data, but you'd be surprised at how much information could be taken from there, and uh, maybe even uh, birth dates, uh, uh, members of the family, uh, the whole family structure, you know, who are your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, your uncles, and so on. Um, Twitter, MySpace, and so on. Um, and one example of how you can use, um, uh, what kind of information, sorry, you can get from it later. Um, I have, yet, I have just used one example here with the EXIF tool, uh, which extracts this uh, metadata. So, 
from just one image that you can find online, let's just say, you can see what kind of camera was used in order to um, um, take the photo. You can see what kind of uh, um, uh, application uh, uh, was used for, uh, to edit this uh, photo. Um, so you can see it was Microsoft Office for Mac. So therefore you can see what operating system I have. Um, and uh, you can also see my uh, username. Uh, in other cases, you will even see the file structure where this particular file uh, was stored. So all of this is actually a lot more information that you might be willing to share. Um, but at the same time, there are, a, there are tools like Montego, for example, which allow you to take input from different to profile people. Uh, and um, you can use email addresses, IP addresses, you can use uh, feeds from social networking sites, from Twitter, from um, uh, Facebook, and so on, um, in order to make a complete story uh, and to get a, a complete picture uh, of that uh, individual that you're trying to target. So, why is this important? Um, so, in, in my view, this is what has changed, and that, that is why social engineering is a lot more important, uh, because it's a lot easier to target people uh, than it used to be 10 years ago. And in many cases, uh, people don't really appreciate the value of information that they post online, and uh, how easy it is for somebody to take that information and to exploit it. Um, so, looking at um, awareness raising and testing for human vulnerabilities. Um, the main questions are, can we spot signs of social engineering? Uh, is it easy to spot social engineering? Um, is there any theory, any guidelines that we can take in order to say, okay, if you follow these instructions, you will definitely be okay. Um, at the same time, can we test human behavior in an ethical manner? Because obviously, um, um, by yeah, testing uh, human behavior involves humans and therefore there are a lot more difficulties uh, than testing machines, servers and so on. Okay? So you have to take into account uh, the ethical um, aspects a lot more. Um, and even if we test human behavior, even if we have uh, ra awareness raising, uh, the most important question is Will it help to improve security? Okay. So, in the first instance, um, this research dates back to 2007. Uh, but uh, the main question uh, that we asked was, can we spot uh, the signs of social engineering? So back then, uh, uh, we asked uh, 179 participants um, to identify. To, uh, we gave them email messages and we asked them to identify whether they were legitimate or not. Um, and the idea is that we wanted to see if you only looked at an email message, would you be able to tell if that message was genuine or not, just based on appearance alone, so uh, not considering the timing or anything like that, okay? just looking at the appearance. Um, so we selected 20 email messages. Um, 11 were illegitimate and 9 legitimate. So uh, the illegitimate messages we, uh, we collected from the artificial website uh, working group where they, they post, um, uh, they provided samples of um, uh, spam messages, but also we added uh, legitimate messages that we had received from companies uh, ourselves, okay, um, in our email inbox. So uh, then uh, another important aspect to remember is that the participants knew in advance that they were asked to identify to spot uh, phishing messages. And that is important to note because um, it could, it has the potential to um, uh, to influence the results and their behavior. So um, the kind of things that we were looking for um, in terms of uh, the science of um, social engineering uh, in phishing messages was whether there was a specific sender or a recipient. Uh, you would expect the phishing messages at that time anyway to be quite generic. So dear user or dear uh, 
guest or whatever, dear customer, not to have a, a specific uh, email address um, or a, a specific name. Um, we looked whether um, they had a company logo, uh, which of course is very easy to obtain uh, from the web. And so this wasn't a very good metric anyway, but uh, this is something that we try to look at. Um, also the language, quite often phishing um, messages or spam email would have an informal language with uh, grammatical errors, uh, typing mistakes, spelling mistakes, um, and it would, it would not be to the same standard that you would expect uh, from formal um, um, uh, correspondence. Um, and uh, the more important um, uh, characteristics would be whether they were asking users to click on a, a URL, uh, so to follow a link, or whether they were asking uh, users to enter any personal details. So, Looking at uh, the final results, um, we can see that, uh, so what users um, uh, responded, um, we can see basically a, a great deal of confusion. Um, we can see that um, overall 42% correctly classified um, um, uh, the, the messages, so they said legitimate or legitimate and illegitimate or illegitimate, um, and 32% were incorrectly classified. Um, we also gave uh, users the option to say, I don't know, um, because that was again really important to see uh, the level of confusion. And again, if you, if you add the incorrect classifications plus the I don't know, that amounts to a significant amount, a significant percentage. So it's more than half of the, uh, the users either didn't know or they couldn't um, say whether the message was legitimate or not. Um, and also, uh, what we saw was that users were more likely to um, identify a message as illegitimate rather than legitimate. So they were uh, more likely to press the button of uh, false rather than true. Um, and again, that could relate to the fact that they they knew already, they knew in advance that they were asked to spot uh, phishing messages. But looking at um, uh, their answers in more detail, so looking at the particular uh, questions, um, we can see um, in certain cases um, where they got it completely wrong or where, you know, where they got it right. And when we try to analyze their responses, um, for these messages uh, and understand basically whether they can support uh, the signs or not. What did we find out from that study? Um, it was obviously interesting to see what people thought, their perceptions. Uh, we saw a great deal of confusion um, and um, more importantly, uh, more respondents or respondents were more cautious uh, in terms of classifying genuine messages as illegitimate. Okay. Um, and that could be because we told them in advance, this is what we want you to do, tell us if these messages are legitimate or not. Um, so, another thing that um, we, uh, we learned was that it's actually quite difficult, and uh, this came across from the, the comments that uh, respondents were giving us. It, it was actually very difficult to judge whether a message was legitimate or not, because we had taken away all the context, so the timing, and uh, we have taken away, you know, it, the same message if it arrived in a different context would, uh, could be a lot more convincing. Okay? Um, so, therefore, the next question was, well, what would happen in a real life scenario if uh, uh, respondents were not aware that they were being tested, um, and if they were presented, with a real life scenario where they have to act and make a decision on what to do. And so the next study uh, did exactly that. So he looked at um, the, uh, the susceptibility uh, of uh, organizational employees to social engineering. Um, so uh, what we did is um, there was a, an organization who wanted to um, 
to test their employees. Um, and um, we sent an email. Obviously, this was uh, 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 this was a sensitive study, okay, and we have to take into account all the ethical issues of this. Um, there was one uh, problem: the fact that it was important for the respondents to. Sorry. It was important for the respondents to not be aware in advance that they were participating in this research. Uh, and that they were not aware of what they were being asked. And so, um, at the, uh, as a result, um, we, um, we had to make sure that, first of all, users would not be uh, disadvantaged, that all the responses were anonymous, that we had no way of tracking them, uh, who responded in what way. So we, only, we could only track um, uh, what the responses was, not who responded. Um, and we had to make sure that after uh, the end of the study, we had given information uh, to the users uh, to raise their awareness and to uh, explain to them what the study was about. So um, the study uh, involved sending an email uh, to all employees claiming to be from the IT department um, and asking them to install a software update by following a link to an external uh, website. Um, now, because we wanted to test um, the behavior of the employees, we had to make it really obvious um, that it was a social engineering attack. Um, and so, uh, the email was badly written and uh, it contained a lot of errors. Also, the website um, that uh, it, um, it directed users to was really badly um, designed um, and um, it looked very unprofessional. Um, and so, to somebody, it would scream out, you know, this isn't right, okay? Um, so, uh, in the email, for example, we had a, an unusual title, uh, an unusual sender uh, from an external domain. Uh, which wasn't a uh, domain of the company. Um, we had a generic recipient, no particular individuals. Um, as I said, the language was really bad. Uh, we intentionally introduced grammatical errors and spelling mistakes, uh, no company logo, um, and also the URL pointed to an external website. Uh, but more importantly, um, the, we, have, we, we were asking users to um, interact in an unusual way because the company would never communicate with the users uh, in that way about software upgrades. So basically the software upgrades were being done automatically by the company. Okay? And another important comment to make was that we used information in that email that was already available in the external uh, company website. So no insider information. Okay, to make it more convincing. We only looked at the publicly available information. Even if the users clicked on the link um, to go into this website, uh, they still had to click another uh, button in order to download the software. So even the, the idea behind this was that even if they um, clicked uh, on the initial link by mistake, uh, they still needed to click on the link to proceed to download the upgrade. Uh, so this definitely had to be intentional. Um, uh, so the download of uh, the application, the software upgrade. Um, and the results were actually very revealing. Um, so we sent 152 emails and 23% uh, uh, within 40 minutes 23% uh, of the employees clicked on the link of the URL and they downloaded uh, the attachment, which the attachment was nothing else other than a way to track whether the link was clicked uh, or not, and it didn't provide any other information. Um, so um, we had to abort um, the experiment after 40 minutes um, because um, we uh, or the IT department became uncomfortable uh, with the rate uh, that um, the rate of success, uh, I guess, or the, the 
the results, uh, but also because um, they, some of the, uh, the employees, they didn't complain as such, but they started asking questions. And so at that point, they said, well, okay, at that point, we, if we were aware of um, this uh, situation, we would stop the experiment, we would stop the activity, and we would block the activity. So in reality, we couldn't get to monitor the exact responses of all 152 um, participants. And in fact, these emails were sent towards the end of the day, when some of the employees might not check their email before they go home. Possibly if we had left it running a little bit longer, maybe until the end of the day, um, we would have a, a much higher um, percentage. But still, um, the 23% um, was in line with uh, the previous study we did, where it was about 26, yeah, 30, about 30%. So it was, the results were comparable um, of, um, uh, yeah, of uh, what we found. Uh, and, um, what was more interesting was um, the comments we had from uh, the participants because, as we said, after they, um, uh, they um, uh, completed the study, we had to send an email to all the people who were tested uh, and to explain to them what that email was about and the fact that it was um, um, a test. Uh, we wanted to see how they reacted in a realistic scenario and then we also had further resources uh, that people could look at uh, in terms of uh, defending against uh, social engineering and against phishing attacks and so on. And as a result, what we got was a lot of information, very useful data actually, feedback from the people. Um, nobody complained, nobody was against uh, the idea. In fact, a lot of um, uh, the users, a lot of the respondents, uh, actually uh, uh, were caught off guard. And um, so I will just provide two uh, examples. So uh, one comment said, you've got me, and uh, that is a bit of a wake-up call for me, as I like to believe that I know what I'm doing in terms of not opening emails that look suspicious and looking at where links take me uh, before I click them. And it just goes to show uh, how easily somebody uh, can be fooled. Um, and um, then another comment was very nifty. Uh, one always looks out for phishing using the identity of banks and other large uh, corporations, but one never expects uh, the IT department to be misused for these purposes. Um, and so he, uh, that particular respondent was almost ready to fire off an email to the IT department and complain about the unprofessionalism at which they contacted them. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was very revealing. And uh, first of all, how easily people can be fooled if they don't expect it, okay? Um, but also the fact that they didn't really complain and they appreciated the fact that, uh, or the intention behind this uh, experiment. Um, so, the second, the, sorry, the, the final question is, okay, we, um, uh, it's not very easy to spot the signs of uh, social engineering, especially in the context of phishing messages, but definitely a lot more difficult to spot the signs in uh, targeted attacks. Um, in a realistic scenario, uh, especially if you don't expect it, uh, um, it is quite revealing how people uh, behave and respond to these situations. And so the, the next study, uh, actually it, it didn't take place, uh, it, it wasn't something that we did, uh, uh, but it took place in the US, in a naval college. And it showed um, how um, awareness, the level of awareness can improve uh, by irregular testing. Um, and so uh, they conducted a study over three years at this uh, naval college, um, and uh, the results showed that say the, uh, the first years were um, initially more susceptible to um, social engineering attacks but as time went on and they progressed through their uh, regular training and regular testing they became uh, a lot better okay um, and uh, so they were testing against three things um, every year as uh, regular intervals they would test them okay um, and the regular points in their studies. So they would test them whether they would follow an URL, 
whether they would enter sensitive data in an anonymous form and whether they would open uh, an attachment. Okay? So, looking at uh, the results, we can see that um, uh, the, uh, the students definitely knew not to um, click on a, a URL. Um, they were sort of um, quite good at um, uh, not downloading attachment, but it was a lot easier to trick them and fool them in terms of revealing sensitive information. Um, but what is more revealing, actually, is the next slide, which shows you the level of uh, success uh, or failure at uh, different intervals for the freshman, the sophomore, the junior, and the senior. So the freshman would say the first year, sophomore, second year, junior, third year, and senior, final year. Okay? So you can clearly see a, a marked difference uh, in terms of uh, their success, so the, yeah, the, the failure rate. So, um, you can see that initially, um, uh, for the freshmen, uh, the freshmen, sorry, um, the results were a lot higher, but um, as uh, the years progressed and they progressed through their studies, the, uh, the results will be, became a lot lower. Okay, so um, this is, yeah, this is really important. Okay, so if you compare the results of 2003 and 2005 for the seniors, um, you can see um, a big difference. So that shows to us how effective um, user awareness is, but also how regular testing can help improve and train uh, users. So just telling users about um, the theory uh, behind um, security is one thing, but at the same time, if you're regularly testing them, uh, that will definitely reinforce uh, the message and get them to uh, appreciate the message a lot more. Okay, so what have we learned basically from uh, these studies? Um, that um, it is important, uh, first of all, uh, for the organizations and the employees to understand the value of information uh, that uh, they post, uh, so uh, that they have available in their websites. Uh, by the way, if you Google um, uh, for, uh, I don't know, X and S or uh, documents, or if you Google for a particular organization and a type of file, then you're going to be surprised uh, the amount of um, uh, confidential information that could be available, um, publicly available, or left, or being forgotten. So understanding the value of the information um, that employees uh, give out, let's say, social networking sites is really, really important. Um, and as a result, regular testing really needs to be done. Um, all the, uh, the metadata that could be available from documents, PDF files, images, and so on, um, online forums, social networks, job websites, all of these provide a lot more information than organizations would really like to, uh, to share. And for large organizations, they are, they are already wise to, uh, to these techniques, and so they watch out a lot more. Uh, but for smaller organizations, um, uh, it is a problem. Um, also, we have seen that uh, awareness raising works and regular testing for human vulnerabilities works. Um, and uh, it is really important to perform practical assessments to test user behavior in a real life scenario because only then they can be caught off guard. Of course, it will need to be done uh, in an ethical uh, Text and uh, you need to take into account the ethical issues in there to make sure users are not um, um, affected, they are, they are not disadvantaged in any way, so they are not singled out and that uh, they, they will not um, um, have any consequences as a result. Um, but it is really important, it, it is really helpful. Okay? Um, uh, as a final comment, I would just um, like to share sort of some guidelines that we have and where we think that the, the training uh, needs to focus on. So rather than um, educate users on spotting the signs of social engineering, uh, which is very difficult to do, and we have seen in our early studies that it was very difficult to do even for the phishing messages, 
Um, and as social media here becomes a lot more convincing, it is a lot more difficult to spot the signs. Uh, so instead of looking at the signs, uh, what we think is more um, useful is to think of what people are asked to do. Okay, so uh, we, uh, we suggest a list approach which stands for legitimacy, importance, source and timing. So um, if you've been presented with an unusual situation, uh, it is useful to think, um, does this request seem legitimate and usual? Um, uh, would you be asked for this type of information? Uh, and is this how you would normally provide it? Uh, if there are warning signs in every single step, um, then you need to ask for help, basically. Okay. So uh, another thing is the importance of information, which I can appreciate can be quite difficult to judge. Um, but educating users on the importance of information uh, is very important. So uh, that relates to um, the value of the information you're being asked to provide, or the tasks that you're being asked to perform, and how what will be the potential of this to be misused. Um, then the source, um, somebody's claiming to be, I don't know, the CEO or somebody really important, uh, but are they really? And is there any way to check? Um, and uh, similarly, uh, what is quite often a characteristic of social engineering attacks is the time. There's usually some urgency. You have to make a decision on the spot. And so an important um, question is, do you have to respond right now? Um, and if you still have doubts after you look at, you, you think of all these different, uh, all the previous points, um, is it really important to respond right now? Um, maybe you can take a few minutes to check and ask for questions or to ask for somebody else's help um, and um, in a way uh, this, if, you know, if, you, if uh, training uh, focuses on these steps, uh, we feel it will become more successful. Alright, thank you very much.